Today we're going to be looking at Gideon's 300. We've been in this story for several weeks now, just how God's been working in this guy who is, starts off hiding in a wine press and a hole in the ground. Fear these Midianite raiders are going to come and just take everything they've got and how God just takes this, this man of fear and turns him into an incredible man of faith. Now I just want to share a little bit about my story. I'm just going to tie it in with this study we're going to be looking at in Judges chapter 7. And some of you have heard some of my, my story that you know, I went to IU to be a jazz major. I played trombone. I started in the sixth grade, and I kind of started playing the instrument because they needed trombone players. That's the only reason why, you know, when you're in the sixth grade, you're just, you're not really thinking about life and everything. But when I got in high school, our, our band director introduced me to a jazz album of two of the most famous trombone players, and I just fell in love with it. You know, and so I just, I just had this desire in me in that time to just to become a professional jazz trombonist. So I went to a creative arts school in Cincinnati from grades 5 all the way to 12 and was a music major the latter part of my high school career. And that. So when I graduated from high school, I went on tour with a brass group for three months, touring around the United States, or three weeks, um, traveling around the United States. And then I ended up in California, and me and a couple of best friends, we were going to just kind of settle in California and try to start our music career. Well, I had already auditioned for, for IU, School of Music. It's one of the top music schools in the world. And, you know, and so after kind of being out there for a little bit, I just kind of decided to come back. So I came back in the fall and started in January of 1983 at Indiana University, kind of in the middle of the school year. Now, some of you heard my story a couple weeks ago that my first couple days on campus, all right, a young guy came by my dorm room, this was before classes started, and shared the gospel with me. He drew out the bridge illustration. I never understood the, the whole picture of how we're separated from God and how Jesus died on the cross. And so that night I prayed to receive Christ and I was like all in. I was like, okay, God, I want to follow you with everything I got. So, so I got involved in that ministry and I started to, you know, to study the, the scriptures. So during this first week of school, right before classes started, being a performance major, I had to audition to be in one of the ensembles. If you're a performance major, you have to play in an ensemble. So I was going to audition to be in a jazz band, right? Jazz major, should play in a jazz band. Well, they, at that time, they had three jazz bands. Now, the way they had it set up, and I know this is a long story, but just kind of building it, we're going to get back to Gideon here, is that you audition for the ensembles at the beginning of the school year in September, and then you play in that ensemble all the way till May. All right, till the end of the school year. Now, sometimes people schedule, they have conflicts with classes. So some of them had to drop out of jazz band. So when I show up as an incoming freshman in January, there were three positions open out of nine, okay? There's three positions open. So I go over to the music school and I audition. I was really nervous as a freshman, but I auditioned, felt pretty decent about my audition. And then, you know, you have to wait a couple days and then they post them. See, back in the old days, you know, they had to send messengers with stone, to carve it. No, it wasn't that bad. But they would tape it on a wall and you had to go back and look. And so I go back and sure enough, I made it in a jazz band. Now, and I'm not saying this to brag, but I'm telling you, that's unheard of for an incoming freshman to audition with only three spots open and to get into a jazz band. And so you have to understand, I'm just like, I'm like pumped. I'm like, God, you are awesome. You, you send a guy to my dorm room, I come to faith, you know, and, and now you're going to be with me and my life is just going to be awesome. I got into a jazz band, this is like unheard of. And so I'm, I'm just like pumped. I get through that semester, I go home and you heard this part of my story a couple weeks ago. I started a Bible study at my home church about what it means to be a Christ follower and drew out the bridge illustration and was able to lead several people to Christ. What it meant, you know, to, to, to really be a Christ follower because they didn't teach it in my church. I never heard it growing up. And so I, I just can't wait to get back to school in the fall. I mean, I am just just so pumped. God is just going to rock my world and everything's just going to be awesome. Well, this is the state where Gideon is, all right? Gideon's like, he's been in this hole. He's, he's fearful. And then, you know, he's wrestling with God and his faith. And God just graciously shows up and just does miracle after miracle. And last week we looked at the whole fleece thing. All right, and, and so, so now, you know, Gideon, you know, blows the horn. 32,000 men from Israel show up to go to war against their enemies, all right? And so he's like, yeah, this is actually going to work. 32,000 guys show up. They're ready to go to battle, and then Gideon gets cold feet. <laughs> and he's like, okay, God, is, is this real or not? Is this, is this really what you want me to do? And that's when he puts the fleece out, and God just performs a miracle to where he brings him to a place where he is pumped. He's like, yes, you are with me. He had very little experience with God at this point in time, 
Okay, he was pretty young in his faith where I was. And he's like, pump, let's do this thing. And this is what we're going to pick up in Judges chapter 7. Now we're going to go through all of chapter 7 today. So it's going to take us a couple hours. But I'm going to read as fast as I can to get through this. Some of you are awake. Okay, so, so, so Gideon's at this point where he's just basically saying, okay, God, let's do this. I am confident now. This miracle's happened. Let's do this. God is with us. So we're going to pick up Judges chapter 7, verse 1. It says, early in the morning, Jerubbaal, that is Gideon. So now they're calling him Jerubbaal. Why? Because we looked at it a couple weeks ago. He tore down the altar of Baal that his father had set up. It had an incredible stifling influence, spiritual influence, a stronghold among God's people. He tears it down. So Jerubbaal means one who contends with Baal. Now, you know, Gideon, he's like, he's the dude. All right, he's contended with Baal and he is still alive. So now they're calling him Jerubbaal, okay, which is Gideon. And all of his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. Verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me. Saying something like, my own strength has saved me. Now, now this is where this story gets really interesting, all right. Because it's like, you know, getting into this place where he's just getting all excited. It's like, okay, God, let's go do this. Let's do this. You've shown me all these things. I'm ready to go. Let's do this. And God's like, you got too many guys. There's too many men. So we got to make a couple little tweaks here. All right. Verse three. This is where it gets really interesting. Verse three. Now, God's telling him, he says, now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. Now this is crazy. 22,000 men. I mean, I mean, come on, God, Gideon's like ready to go. And he's got 32,000 men, and they all just run, 22,000. Now we're going to see here in a minute why those 22,000 left. I probably would have left too, all right? Because they're up against incredible odds here. 22,000. Now he's only got 10,000. Now, when we look in Scripture, we actually see two things. One, it's actually a very strategic move with military. Because you don't want to show up and get ready to go to battle and have a bunch of guys back out right at the last minute when you're, you're ready to engage. And they all run. And it's just, it's just defeating. All right? So you don't want to do that. And plus, in the Old Testament, when God spoke to Moses and gave him the commands, one of the things that he put in the law was, when I call you to battle, if there's any men among you who are full of fear, send them home. Now, why would God do that? Well, let me just suggest this with this bullet point. Is that fear and faith are very similar. All right, they're very similar, it's, you know, but the difference is they're both infectious, but they result in completely opposite outcomes. And when you're around a bunch of people that are full of fear, they're just going to keep running and hiding like Gideon started off his journey. But when you're with a team of people that are full of faith, they will follow you to do whatever because they have, they're fully confident that God is going to do what God has said he's going to do. And so God's like, we got to get rid of all these men that are full of fear because they're not gonna be effective in accomplishing what I'm calling you to accomplish. And so fear and faith, they, they're both infectious and they result in completely opposite outcomes. And God's been working in Gideon's life to move him away from fear to finally getting to be confident and to live by faith. But God's not done with him yet. So 22,000 leave. And now he's left with 10,000, all right? So the story goes on. Verse four, the Lord says to Gideon again, Hey, dude, there's still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you. I'll thin you out for you there. If I say there is one, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. Verse 5. So Gideon took the man down to the water there. The Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. All right, so now... We see in Scripture that God favors dogs over any other animal. He doesn't say cats, all right? Because we all know cats are from hell, right? Dogs are... <laughs> I'm just saying that because last year, Roger gave a whole message about putting down dogs. So I just wanted to kind of boost the dog lovers. How many of your dog lovers? 
All right. So God's like, I want those that are dog lovers to go to battle. All right. That's what he's saying. Well, not really. So what he's saying here is that those that, that lap water like a dog, what, what's significant here is that they're poised for battle. They don't have their heads down sucking it up like a straw. You know, not looking forward. All right. But they're keeping their eyes up like a dog does when it drinks water. So they're poised for battle. And so here's what happens. Verse 6, six 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. So these guys are they're cupping up the water. Like a, I don't know if you've ever seen a dog tongue. I should have put a picture of it. But a dog's tongue actually works like a hand. All right? It cups the water and brings it up. So these guys are cupping it up and then drinking it out of their hands. All right, but they're poised. They can see what's going on. They're poised, ready for battle. And so verse 7 says, The Lord said to Gideon, With 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. Now, honestly, I don't know why Gideon just didn't walk away at this point in time. I don't know why he didn't. Because we're going to see here in just a moment just how crazy this is. Verse 8. So Gideon, what did he do? He sent the rest of all the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and the trumpets of the others. All right, he sends all, all these other ones home. All he's got left is 300. Now here's what's crazy, all right? Now, how many of you love math? How many of you just hate math and did terrible at math? That's how I was. I struggled with math. I hated math. Well, when we look in the scriptures, God's math would just blow math teachers away because God's math is so different from the math of this world. And I've got an example here. This is God's math. God's math says that 300 is greater than 135,000. Because when we read chapter 8, we see that there was 135,000 of these eastern people, the Midianites, the Amicalites, these others that were there in the valley of Jezreel waiting, camping out with their camels. They look like a swarm of locusts waiting. It's harvest time, and they're just waiting to take over and raid Israel of everything they've got, leaving them in complete devastation and poverty. Now, I think I would have been with that 22,000 would have left in the first place. Because when you're thinking, we only got 32,000, okay, now the odds of 32,000 is four to one ratio. When he had 32,000, that means that every, every Israelite would have to kill at least four of, these, of their enemies. Now God changes the odds from four to one to 450 to one. That is impossible. That is completely impossible. God's mass is at 300 is greater than 135,000. Now, why would God do that? Because of this. Put this bullet point up here. God's sovereign purpose for us is to fully trust him. Story after story, when we read through the scriptures, God's sovereign purpose purpose for us is to fully trust him, even at times when it doesn't make any sense. When you look at this from a natural perspective, this is a suicide mission. Why would you go against 135,000 people with only 300 men? That's just crazy. There's no way you're going to be able to survive that. And so we see this, this God of the impossible throughout this, this whole story. God shows up to this man hiding in fear, hiding in a, in a wine press, and God says, you're a mighty warrior. How am I a mighty warrior, God? I'm hiding down here threshing wheat. Remember we talked about how God doesn't see us how we are, but he sees who we are going to become. That's how God sees us. All right, And so he calls this, this man who's hiding in fear a mighty warrior. Then when, when Gideon goes a couple weeks ago, we look at he brings this, this meal to this traveler, this angel of the Lord that appears to him. It was enough food to feed 45 people. And now they're, they're devastated, all right? And they're trying to scrimp every little thing they got. And the angel of the Lord consumes that food. It's like, why would you take that, God? That could have fed 45 people. And now you're going to take his troops of 32,000 and whittle it all the way down to a measly 300 to stand against 135,000. Unbelievable. Impossible. It's like, come on, God, what are you doing? Now, let me go back to my story. Because I was in the same place Gideon was. Like, I'm pumped. I'm new in my faith. I'm ready to go back. So I go and, you know, before classes start, you have to go in, you audition for an ensemble, you know. So that, that year, they added a fourth jazz band. I'm like, yeah, that increases my odds, right? 
So there's 12 positions open this year. Then there was only nine last year. But there was only three positions open when I auditioned in the middle of the year. Now I'm starting at the beginning of the year. I am just so excited. I'm pumped. It's like, God, you are awesome. You are so with me. I can't wait to see what jazz band I'm going to get in. So I go and audition. Wait a couple days. Go back over to the music school. You go through the list. Band one. Band two. No. Band three. Nope. Band four. Band one. <laughs> band two. I didn't make it in a jazz band. And, and, and at this point in time, I'm, I'm kind of like thinking, like, it's like, what are you doing, God? What are you doing? I didn't make it in a jazz band. I'm my jazz major. I need to be in a jazz band. I mean, that's how you get better as a jazz musician is being around other jazz musicians. Now, you see, you have to be in an ensemble. And if you don't get in some kind of ensemble, you got to sing in choir. And that's not really music, right? So... <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Man, I'm going to get some bad emails this week. <laughs> so I was like, I'm not a very good singer, so I don't, I don't want to have to sing in a choir. So there was orchestra, and I knew I wasn't good enough to get an orchestra. Because let me tell you, when you show up at the number one music school in the world, because that's what they were rated at that point in time, you quickly learn how big and how incredible the competition is. All right? And so and I knew the competition was stiff, but it's like, God, you're with me. You got me in when there was only three. Surely I can get in when there's 12. And I don't even get in when there's 12. So now I had to go audition for one of these bands. There was symphonic band, which was the higher band. And then there was concert band, which was the low life band. All right? All right? So, so this is for those of the guys that aren't very good. You know, they get in concert band. You know, so at least you're in an ensemble. So you can continue your major, you know, your studies. So I go and audition. It's like, well, at least I'll get in symphonic band. So after I audition, I go back and look at it. I didn't make it in symphonic band. <laughs> So I go and I, and, I, and I look at the list, you know, and I'm all the way down. There's like nine positions, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. Second to last chair in the lowest band on campus. I'm like, God, seriously? Seriously? I mean, where, where are you? I mean, all these things came together. I mean, look what I've done for you. I mean, I went home. I taught this Bible study. I'm leading people to Christ. I mean, I've been a good boy. I mean, I've been reading my Bible every day. I'm trying to pray. And it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're all these promises. Where are you now? Second to last chair on campus? So you know what I did? I turned to the kids sitting last chair, and I said, man, am I glad I'm not you. <laughs> I felt so much better that day. No, I didn't say that. But, but I tell you, it was just like, it was just, it was so hard. And I was like, God, I, I just don't, I don't get this. I, I don't understand this. And, it, and I began to just question, it's like, God, how did I end up here? If you are with me, then how did I end up here? And I'm telling you, that semester, I, I just wrestled with it because I knew I was going to be in the concert band for a whole year. Unless other positions came open, and it was like, how did I end up in this place? And I just really wrestled with God through that. And I just feel like God began to speak to me. He says, look, you have to trust me even when it doesn't make sense. Because God's sovereign purpose for us is to trust him fully. And that was huge for me as a new believer in Christ. And oftentimes we looked at this in this series, God knows where we're weak and he will use it to build our faith. So let me just put this next bullet point up here. If dependence is the objective, then weakness is an advantage. And I know that seems backwards because really when you read scripture, everything in here just seems backwards because Roger shared with us last week, God takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Everything in scripture is about the great reversal. And we just have this, this plan that we need to escalate. But if dependence is the objective, then weakness is an advantage for us. This, this life is not buying into the American dream. There's nothing in scripture that says live out your dream. It's not about that. It's living out our calling and what God calls us to. But everything in our culture pulls us against that. I got to live out my dream. God says, no, I want you to trust me fully. And he's going to do everything he can to get our heart. As he was working in Gideon's life. That it's not about how skilled we are, how much money we can earn, and, and how hard we can do this and work on that. It's, it's not about that. It's about how much we trust God in what, no matter what situation we're in. Because he's after our heart more than anything else. 
And it, isn't it always in the challenging situations that we get in where we begin to press in to God and begin to lean into him and where God's after something much bigger than just all these external things. He's after our heart. And so I just want to put another bullet point up here. It says, we don't often realize that God is all we need until God is all we have. And I've heard that phrase over and over again through the years, that, that we don't really often realize that God is all we need until we come to this place where it's God is all we have. And for Gideon, he's standing there. It's like, this is impossible, God. You, you finally get me to a place where I'm, I'm trusting you, and then you're going to take away all the, these, these men and leave me with a measly 300 to go against these, this swarm of locusts of 135,000 trained raiders. This is impossible. But when we see in the scriptures, we look at a guy like John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist had an incredible ministry. He got to usher in the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And when Jesus showed up on the scene, he went to John the Baptist, who's out in the wilderness baptizing people, and he says, John, you need to baptize me. And John's like, what do you mean? You need to baptize me. And he says, no, you baptize me. Let it be done in order to fulfill all righteousness. And so John the Baptist, he baptizes Jesus. I can only imagine just the feeling. He's like, look what I got to do. This is incredible. My role in fulfilling scripture, I'm the one that prepares the way of the Lord. I mean, it could have been, you know, he could have said, man, I'm just living the dream. But this is what John the Baptist says, recorded in John 3.30. He says this, he must become greater and what I must become less. Now that just doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Because everything we're taught in our culture is complete reversal of that. Jesus says this in Matthew 16, 25. He says, here's the deal. He says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. And when we read those, those words, it's like, Jesus, what are you talking about? This doesn't make any sense. How do I find my life by losing it? It's because God doesn't care about the homes and the cars and all these. It's not that he doesn't care about them. It's like, those aren't the things that constitute our life. He's after our heart, the core of our being. And he will work in and through our life and, and strip things away. As Roger shared with us last week, it's just this, this home makeover thing. And he will do whatever he can because he's after our heart more than anything else to learn to depend and trust him. The scripture tells us this life isn't about us. It's about God. And it's about living a life that glorifies God. And you can imagine if, if they went in, you know, with their 32,000 32, and, and got a victory, they'd be like, yeah. We are, we are cool. We, we can do this. We're better than everybody. And they wouldn't have given glory to God. And we tend to wrestle with this in our lives. And so we come to this place and we see that the, the whole thing that God tells us in his word is that we descend into greatness. Now, that's a bad business plan. <laughs> I mean, nobody wants to put a chart up, you know, when you bring all your associates into a business meeting and say, hey, guys, here's the deal. We're going to decrease in revenue and decrease in business and we're going to grow. You're going to be looking at that guy and say, dude, you're going to run this company right in the ground. I said, no, trust me in this. Now, it is a terrible business plan. But God wants to bring us to a place where he wants us to trust him. And it's a downward descent. Why? Because that's what Jesus modeled for us. Jesus left all of his glory in eternity. And he didn't show up on the scene and say, yeah, it made me a nice big throne. So I can sit right here in the middle of Jerusalem and tell the Sanhedrin that they've got it all wrong and they need to come and sit at my feet and worship me because I came for you to give me glory, so bring it now. That's not what Jesus did at all. He left everything he had in his glory with the Father and he came and humbled himself, as Philippians 2 tells us, and took on humanity and poured out his life on a cross for us. And the whole time, we, we thought we had it all together. We thought we were figuring it out. But this is what Scripture tells us in Romans 5, verse 6. It says, when we, Paul writes this, when we were utterly helpless, all we could do is depend. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. And so when we go through these challenges and these hardships in life, God is after something much deeper, something much bigger. It's dying to self. It's descending, humbling ourselves so God can make the difference. God is the one that brings the victory. So my question would be, what is God try, teaching you through this challenging situation that you're in right now? Because our tendency is we always want to shortcut what God is doing. 
What is he wanting to do? What is he teaching you? Put another bullet point up here on the screen. God brings salvation not through human might, but through humble obedience. We see Moses leading his people out of Egypt. They're standing. We're talking about our little men's meeting this morning. They're standing at the edge of the Red Sea, and they start grumbling, complaining. It's like, Moses, why did you do this? Why did you bring us out here? They're going to kill us. This was a suicide decision. And he says, watch the salvation of our God. And he stepped into the water and put his staff down, and the waters parted, and they went through the Red Sea on dry land. Because God is the God of the impossible. He's the God of the supernatural. And God brings us to a place that it's not through human might, but it's through humble obedience. So let me just, just come back to God's math. Put another equation up here. God plus one faith-filled person equals a majority. It doesn't matter if you're standing up against 135,000. All God needs is one faith-filled person that's willing to trust him. That's God's math. That's what God is after. Our God is a God of the resurrection. And I think that sometimes in this life, we, we watch the, our, these pro athletes that are just incredible, the things that they can do. And, and watching them play their, their sport so eloquently and, and crazy, the moves that they make. And then they're always wanting, hopefully, to just be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And I think there's just a longing as Americans in just our Western mindset that we, we want the notoriety, we want the glory, we want to be in the Hall of, Hall of Fame, but, but God calls us to do something different. He doesn't call us to be in the Hall of Fame, he calls us to be in the Hall of Faith. And when we read Hebrews chapter 11, it just, it just paints this picture of all these men and women that have gone before us. I just want to kind of get some excerpts here because it talks about faith in Hebrews 11. And it says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. 300 against 135,000, this is crazy. But that's what faith is all about. And he goes on, he says, It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat in the middle of the plains. It hadn't even rained before. And he's building this huge boat in the middle of the plains to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about the things that had never happened before. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance. And he went without knowing where he was going. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. It is by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days. We just sang about that. And the walls came crashing down. Why I keep going around? It's like, come on, God, six days, nothing's happening. What's going to be any different on the seventh day? Crazy, crazy, all right? It was by faith. He says, how much more do I need to say? I would, it would take too long to recount the stories of faith of who? A guy hiding in a hole in the ground of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. But then there were others. Others were tortured refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised, for God had something better in mind. And then the writer of Hebrews goes on and says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such an incredible Crowd. It's like the grandstands of the men and women of faith that have gone before us so that we run this race with perseverance, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who didn't come to live out his dream. He came to die on a cross for us. And he calls us to do the same. It's a downward descent. And trusting God, even when things don't make sense. And so God, he just gives this whole picture of this great reversal. And Gideon He's like, God, what are you doing? Why would you do this? And, and when I look back at that season of my life, really my first year, still my first year of becoming a Christ follower, I am so grateful 
for being second to last chair. Because it caused me to dig deep and really press into God and learn to understand that that's the picture of the gospel. That this life isn't about, about me and how great I can become. But it's about my God, my Savior, who poured out everything on a, on a cross for me. That my life, no matter what I do, would bring glory to him. And to humble myself and being willing to die to self for him and live my life for him. And so during that season of time, I changed my major. I started out as a jazz major and I just felt like I was tugging on my heart. It's like, because I knew it was going to be one of two things. I was either going to commit my life to following Jesus Christ with everything I had. Or knowing the competition in the world and how great it was, I was going to have to give everything I had to this piece of brass. And I just wasn't willing to do it. And so I changed my major to audio engineering. And I'm telling you, I'm so grateful for what God did. And you know what's really cool? I'm going to get to this in just a moment. But after that, after I quit being a jazz major, I kept playing in the jazz bands. And I'll come back to that here in just, just a moment. So here, here God's doing this, this crazy thing. And he's like, with 300, I'm going to save you. And it picks up here in verse, the last verse, part of verse 8 and then in verse 9. It says, now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up, go down against the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. All right, so, so Gideon's like, okay, God, I'm going to trust you in this. And if you are afraid to attack, <laughs> now this time God initiates this. What I love about this story, he said, if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura. All right, now, now some scholars believe this was probably maybe his arm bearer, you know, but it was his servant. And he says, and listen to what they're saying. Go down to the camp with him. So he's got a witness to go with you. So they, listen to what they're saying. Afterwards, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, they went down to the outposts of the camp. Now what I see in this is just, as we talked about in this series, just the incredible patience and grace of God. Because, you know, we've just seen Gideon, he's wrestling. Is, is it really you, God? Are you sure you're willing to do this? He puts the fleece out. He's got this miracle. Now he's ready to go. And God says, okay, you got too many men. We're going to whittle all the way down to 300. God, this is just crazy. This is impossible. I'm going to do it, but this is a suicide mission. And God says, okay, let me just build your faith one more time for you. Go down to the camp. Listen in. And you're going to be encouraged. So they do. They sneak down to the camp to listen in. Verse 12. The Midianites, the Amicalites, and all these eastern people had settled in the valley thick as what? Thick as locusts. I mean, it's like this is unbelievable. There's so many of them. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Now, I don't even know that I would want to sneak down to the camp at night. Now, if there's one thing we've learned about Gideon, he's good at doing things at night, right? <laughs> All right, and we're going to see that come to fruition here in this story. He's good at hiding and sneaking up at night. So they go down to the camp. Verse 13, Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. He said, man, I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. And his friend responded, verse 14, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. Now, these guys knew about Gideon. Obviously, there's been, been some stories being told. They've heard about Gideon, but Gideon's no threat. I mean, he blew a horn. Only 32,000 men showed up. We outnumber them four to one. And now they're down to 300. It's like, pfft. but then this guy has a dream. God sends him down there. They listen in. They hear what's going to happen here. And now it's like, God's going to give us. He's going to give us the victory. And so you can't miss the humor in this, all right? It's, it's like there's this round loaf of barley rolling down into a camp and knocking over the tent. Now, God sends you down there to listen in. You hear this story, and you go back to your troops. You guys, hey, team, got a new mascot for us, guys. We're going to really take this camp. We're going to be the tumbling biscuits. I dare you, those that are raising your kids playing sports, to call one of your sports team the Tumbling Biscuits. I mean, come on. It's like, seriously? Now, barley represents kind of a, a poor, a thing of poverty. All right? It was, it was a poverty crop. And so when they hear this and they see the thing barley, they knew it was associated with Israel. And that God was going to give them the victory. This tumbling loaf of barley bread rolls into the camp and turns over this tent. And so Gideon, he's like, thank you, God. Now I'm ready. Let's do this. Verse 15, when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. We've seen this several times in the story. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up, you tumbling biscuits. Let's do this. <laughs> 
Well, it wasn't quite that way, but he says, get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. And I just, you know, it just amazes me, just God's incredible grace in this whole story of a guy who's just struggling, wrestling, trusting God. But here's the deal. Gideon finally comes to this place. At some point in time, you, we've got to step out. All right, so just my, my next point is at some point in time, you just have to step out in faith. God's speaking to you. There's some of you sitting here today, God's been speaking to you. And at some point, we got to step out in faith and trust God with what he's telling us with what he's speaking to us and getting a confirmation from others that are around us, other godly people that we can trust. But we have to come to a place where we step out in faith. We just can't have all this information and do nothing with it. Because it's like, that's great, God. That's great. That's great. But now, no, you got to do it. And it's then when we step out in faith is where God shows up and begins to work and he begins to build our faith even more. All right? And so, so the, this, this story goes on here, all right? Verse 16, it says, Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. And he says, watch me. We hear Paul saying that. Follow my example is what he's saying. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. Verse 18, when I and all of them and all who are with me blow our trumpets which is really a, a shofar, which was a, a ram's horn, all right? All right, trumpets is just kind of easy way for us to grasp it. Blow our trumpets. Then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Verse 19, Gideon and the, and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. So this is at night time, all right? Like I said, Gideon's really good at doing things in the evening. Perfect strategic move, all right? They break up in three groups of 100. Just after the, the guards had changed, they were unprepared. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars who were, that were in their hands. Verse 20, the three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets. So, so you know, they're, and they're holding the torch up, blowing, the, blowing their horns. And as they're doing this, they shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Verse 21. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites, what? They ran. They ran, crying out as they fled. Now, what's the moral of this story? The moral of the story is this. Brass players rule. <laughs> I waited this whole time to say that. Now you understand the video clip? <laughs> all right? <laughs> Brass players rule. No. They ram horns, they weren't really brass yet. So, so the, the cool thing in this whole thing is that God takes these 300 men and he brings this incredible victory. Incredible victory and incredible when the odds were completely against them. They blow trumpets, every one of them. There were 300 horn players with torches. And they shout out for the Lord, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. So they ran, crying out as they fled. Verse 22, when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords, and the army fled. Let me just kind of close with this point. Where God wants to bring us is understanding that the Lord alone brings salvation and victory in your life. It's him and him alone. And because of God and his, his holiness and, and his character, it's just goodness and faithfulness. And we see this throughout the scripture that, that God tells even Moses to, when he gives the law, he says that I will not share my glory with no other. And he wants us to recognize who he is as the author of life, the author of creation, the author of salvation, who gave up everything for us. So we come to a place to fully trust him because salvation is in no other place but in Jesus. And God is the only one that can bring salvation and victory in your life. And that's what God wanted Gideon to know and to understand. That they wouldn't boast and say, hey, look what we did. It's like, no, look what our God did. The battle is the Lord's. It's not ours. And so during that season, after I, I changed my major, you could say I was just surrendering my, my dream and trusting God with it. When I went back and auditioned that next year, 
God opened the door for me to play lead trombone in the second highest band on campus as a sophomore. And it was a totally different, totally different thing at that level. Because the top two bands, you did things differently. You had to meet with your group, your, your, your section, every week and lead them and coach them and make sure that they've learned their parts. And I was, I was just young, you know, and it's, it's like I just really felt like God used that in this time in my life just to teach me leadership. And, and the thing was, I know some of them hated me because I was no longer a performance major, and I'm taking a position that they're all vying for. But God just opened, graciously opened the door for me to be able to do that. And just God wanted me to see and understand this whole thing, that when we trust him, and we deny ourselves and take up our cross, no matter what it is that we're dealing with, no matter what challenges are in front of us, when we trust him with it, God will bring, he'll bring the victory. He will bring the increase. Amen? Because our God and our God alone is the one who brings salvation. And he wants us to fully trust him. Let's pray.